I would like to begin tonight by talking about a subject that I think is uh, rather important. It's not timely, but I think it's timeless. I usually get at least once every two weeks a question either on this radio show or an email question to me in response to my articles on my website, harrybrown.org. Someone asking me if I have read The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin, which is a uh, story of how the bankers, uh, some of the big bankers in the United States, got together in a secret meeting on Jekyll Island and mapped out the Federal Reserve System back in 1913. And I think that this whole idea of the conspiracy of bankers to create the Federal Reserve System is emblematic of a lot of different subjects that concern us. And so I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss this. First of all, some background. Before 1913, uh, money in the United States was issued and generated in a different way from the way it is now. Most of the money that was used were dollars that were printed by private banks as receipts for gold. And uh, people would go in and uh, bring gold in and get dollars or take dollars in and get gold and so on, and the dollars were used in exchange. In addition, the federal government did not issue Federal Reserve notes, but it did issue notes that were called gold certificates. People would bring gold to the Treasury, mostly miners bringing gold to the Treasury, and the government would give them these gold certificates in exchange, and then the gold certificates would uh, it, uh, circulate as dollars. There would be $20 certificates, $10 certificates, uh, I think even $1 certificates. And in addition to that, the Treasury also minted gold into coins. And at the time, the official price of gold was $20.67, and the most popular federal coin was the double eagle, which was a $20 gold piece containing just a little bit less than one ounce of gold. And this was the system that existed. But in 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed, and as a result of the Federal Reserve Act passing, we had a series of 12 federal reserve banks around the country, and um, uh, the mints that had before just printed a few gold certificates, but mostly were minting gold coins and silver coins, now began to issue federal res uh, print Federal Reserve notes at the direction of the Federal Reserve System, and those became the uh, dollar bills and $5 bills and $10 bills and so on that were in general circulation in the country, and it revolutionized the system. The idea was that we needed central banking in this country, that we could not leave this to the vagaries of the free market and what private banks would do and so forth, and the idea was that this would, number one, it would protect banks from failures which had happened, leaving sometimes depositors holding the bank. Number two, it would stop the periodic depressions, panics, and recessions that occurred in the United States. And number three, it would create what was called an elastic currency, which would be able to deal with those recessions and depressions, but more important, would be able to keep a level price uh, level in this country uh, and, uh, and any period of inflation, which incidentally had never been much of a problem in the United States except for during the Civil War when the U.S. government had issued a bunch of currency directly that was backed up by nothing, convertible into nothing, and flooded the country with it and caused the gigantic inflation. There had also been an inflation before the United States of America during the Revolutionary War when similar things were done and the Continentals, as they were called, became relatively worthless. Well, the result of the Federal Reserve System has been a disaster. As to stopping bank panics, we had the worst uh, run of bank failures the country had ever seen in 1933. Secondly, we had the worst depression the country had ever seen ranging from 1929 up and, uh, through the end of the Second World War. Nothing like that had ever been seen in this country before. And as for inflation, we had never had an inflation such as we have had since the end of the Second World War, where it has been constant inflation. Uh, sometimes it's as low as 1% or 2% a year. It has been as high as 15% a year. But inflation is almost always with us. So the Federal Reserve System has been an absolute disaster. Now, G. Edward Griffin wrote a book called The Creature from Jekyll Island. And in this book, he said that, the bankers from J.P. Morgan and the Rothschilds and other people got together in a secret meeting on Jekyll Island, which I believe is off the coast of the Carolinas, and plotted out this idea of creating a Federal Reserve System. Now, as it happens, I happen to know G. Edward Griffin. I met him a long, long time ago, many years ago in a galaxy far away. In fact, we worked together uh, very closely in an organization. And I happen to know him as a very intelligent, very logical person, and I have no doubt that he has the facts of the matter are probably right, even though I've never read the book. I'm willing to go on record saying that I believe the book probably is very accurate. The question is, is it important that bankers got together and plotted this whole idea of foisting the Federal Reserve System on the country? If you think that they did it in order to make greater profits, then you probably are wrong because the Federal Reserve System is not privately owned. It does not put billions or trillions of dollars into the hands of private individuals. Most of the profits generated by the Federal Reserve System goes to the United States Treasury, and uh, the President of the United States appoints the uh, Chairman of the Board of Governors, who for many, many years now has been Alan Greenspan, and it has not been a big deal for the private bankers. In fact, it has been a form of regulation on the private bankers. But the important question is this. Does it matter 
is it of any importance whatsoever that private bankers got together and foisted this on the American people? Let's for the moment say that that's one possible scenario. The second possible scenario is that these same bankers, instead of doing it in secret, went before Congress and had some friend introduce a bill to uh, create the Federal Reserve System, and these bankers testified before Congress and gave their opinions, and their opinions won out, and we wound up with the Federal Reserve System. Or the third possibility would be that the bankers weren't even involved at all, but that some progressive congressman or senator uh, decided that this would be a good thing for America. And he introduced it and persuaded enough other uh, senators or congressmen to get it through committee, and then it went out in the House and in the Senate and became law, and maybe even was presented as a way of dampening the profits and the control and the power of private bankers. And, of course, this was the progressive era that when this happened in 1913, the progressive era uh, that lasted basically from 1880 to about 1920. And this was the time when the antitrust laws were passed, when the Federal Trade Commission was created, the Interstate Commerce Commission was created, the Income Tax Amendment was passed in 1913, and a whole lot of people who were called progressives, uh, uh, most of them in the Republican Party, uh, put through all kinds of reforms that gave government powers that it had never had before in an attempt to stop what they considered to be the worst abuses of the private enterprise system, the free market, and uh, free individuals uh, voluntarily interacting with each other. So now you have three possible ways that the Federal Reserve System could have been created. The question is this. What difference does it make which one of the, which one of the methods was used to create the system? The problem is not how it was created, but what it created. What it was that we have suffered in this country for the past uh, almost 90 years as a result of the Federal Reserve System. It doesn't matter whether it was a secret conspiracy or the well-meaning attempts of well-meaning people to create well-meaning legislation that was going to do all kinds of wonders for the United States. And it is a mistake to focus on the origin or the machinations behind the scene or the secret conspiracies or anything of this sort. It is simply a waste of time. What we have to show people is the dangers of the system that has been created and how much better off they would be if we didn't have that system, if we restored the system of free enterprise uh, that had created the prosperity that gave people the money and the wealth in this country uh, to confiscate. And it's the same thing with whatever we're talking about. It doesn't matter whether the battle in, in Iraq is really a secret attempt to monopolize the Iraqi oil supplies for the oil refiners and the oil companies of America. It doesn't matter whether Donald Rumsfeld really believes his rhetoric about uh, making Iraq free and liberating the people. And it doesn't matter whether George Bush is just a well-meaning buffoon or whether he is the worst kind of uh, dictator would be. It doesn't matter. What matters is that thousands of people have died over there, including a thousand Americans. What matters is that hundreds of billions of dollars of American resources have been wasted. What matters is that it is wrong for America to stir up trouble in other parts of the world because that's what causes people to come over here and run airplanes into the World Trade Center building. What matters is the result, not the motive. What matters is the result, not the way it came about. And this is what we must focus on. And I just read so many things that attempt to go behind the scenes and to show who these secret conspirators are today, yesterday, a hundred years ago, or whatever. And I think it is an absolute waste of time. And I think by focusing on these conspirators and focusing on these machinations, that what happens is two things. Number one, we get diverted from the real task of convincing the American people that turning our fortunes over to government is a horrible, horrible mistake. And uh, that we need to focus on how much better life could be if we got rid of these systems and got rid of these programs, and got rid of the subsidies, and got rid of the regulation, and got rid of uh, the war-making powers, and all of these things. We have to do that in order to make life better for Americans. And secondly, the danger in focusing on the conspiracies and so on is we simply turn people off. We sound like raving lunatics. We sound like people who think the Jews are trying to run the world, or that the Illuminati is behind all of this, or that the communists are still secretly in control in Russia, and, and on and on and on. And uh, we do nothing then to uh, recruit to our cause anyone other than people who love those conspiracies. And that is a terrible mistake to try to make up our movement for a freer America of people who love to get involved in conspiracies because such people love to hate. They love to find people to point the finger at, to, to simply hate. That's what they want is to find villains to hate. I don't care about the villains. I just want to get rid of the bad system. I want to get the America back, the America that created the prosperity and the wealth and the freedoms that government has intruded upon. I want to get back the America that made it possible for people to get guns and go out and rob other people. Only this time, when we get that America back, we've got to find a way to keep it for all time so that we can live out the rest of our lives in peace and liberty, something that we have neither of today. And so 
I think what we, again, as I've said so often, we need to focus and focus always on how much better people's lives could be. There are so many blessings of liberty that we can show people. How much better their children's education would be if we didn't have government running the schools. How much better their lives could be if we reduced government so much that there was no income tax. How much better their retirements could be if we didn't have a social security system that drained 15% of their incomes away from them and then gave them very little back except promises and IOUs. How much better our prosperity could be if government were not regulating business with a fine-tooth comb. You know, last week the death penalty came up in the show, and I said I wasn't sure whether there was an outright position in the Libertarian Libertarian Party's platform on the death penalty, and so I checked it out during the week, and there is no Libertarian Party position for or against the death penalty. However, there is a very interesting element in the platform, and that is that the Libertarian Party believes that jurors should not be excused for opposition to the death penalty in capital cases. In other words, when... Uh, checking out the jurors before the trial, the prosecution will ask the juror if he has an opposition to the death penalty, if this is a capital case in which uh, the defendant, if found guilty, could be put to death. Does the juror have any opposition to the death penalty? And the Libertarian Party says that that is wrong to excuse jurors because they oppose the death penalty because it creates then a jury that is not representative of the community as a whole. And I think that's a very interesting uh, position. And I think that it is also true that if you have only jurors who are in favor of the death penalty, you probably have jurors who are inclined to believe most of what the government says. If the government says this person did a terrible thing, then they're inclined to believe them, and they're inclined not to believe that anybody has ever put to death mistakenly because nobody is ever convicted unless he's really guilty, and people who feel that way generally feel that no one is even ever prosecuted unless he's really guilty, that the police and the prosecutors have all been not only honest all along the way, but efficient and careful and checked everything out. And uh, I think that that's a very good uh, position in the platform by the Libertarian Party to say that jurors should not be excused for opposition to the death penalty in capital cases. And just in case you weren't listening last week, I said that I definitely oppose the death penalty, and the principal reason I oppose it is because government proves to be wrong so often. And once somebody has been put to death, there's nothing that can be done to bring him back. When government makes a mistake in a case like that, it's fatal. And we're going to talk now with John in Massachusetts. Good evening, John. How are you doing, Mr. Brown? It is an honor to speak with you. Well, thank you. It's an honor to have you call in. What's happening? Um, I just wanted to beg to differ with you on a couple of things. Sure. Well, specifically, you mentioned that uh, you didn't think the Federal Reserve was privately owned. Mm-hmm. I have a book in front of me, if you'd let me read a couple of paragraphs. Um, the title of it is Money and Capital Market. Who wrote the book? Miles Livingstone. It was published in 1996, third edition. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, chapter 4 of the Federal Reserve, sub-chapter uh, is uh, Federal Reserve Organization, if, it, if you wouldn't mind. No, go ahead. Okay. This is the uh, second paragraph of the chapter. The Federal Reserve System is composed of, composed of 12 districts, each of which has a Federal Reserve district bank and branches. These Federal Reserve banks are privately owned by the commercial banks that are Federal Reserve members in that district. The Federal Reserve pays dividends on the stock. Each district Federal Reserve Bank has nine directors, six of which are selected by commercial banks that are members of that district, and three selected by the Board of Governors. Each district bank has a president who participates in the Federal Open Market Committee. That is the uh, second paragraph. It was the, the sixth paragraph I also wanted to read if you didn't mind. Go ahead. Second, the Federal Reserve System is not directly subject to control by executive and legislative branches of the government because the members of the Board of Governors are appointed for 14-year terms and because the Federal Reserve Banks are privately owned. That is, the Federal Reserve has the power to set monetary policy, independent of the wishes of the President and both Houses of Congress. However, since the Federal Reserve was established by an act of Congress, and since the Federal Reserve powers can be changed by further congressional action, the Federal Reserve is subject to long-run the pressure from Congress. Thus, the Federal Reserve actions cannot be too far out of line with congressional preferences. I just wanted to get your comment on that. Sure. Well, if it were a private organization, why would it have been created by an act of Congress? There is no business that I know of in the United States or a private organization that was created by an act of Congress. Uh, Private organizations, private businesses are created by private individuals uh, deciding to go into business or to start an organization and raising the capital to do so and so on and so forth. What happened with the Federal Reserve System was that Congress passed an act and it, it ordered every national bank in the country to join the Federal Reserve System and it ordered by law that each of those banks put up 6% of its capital as stock in the Federal Reserve System. In other words, each bank was compelled to put up 6% of its capital as a purchase of stock in the local Federal Reserve Bank. The dividends that are paid by the Federal Reserve Banks are not 
just whatever profits accrue to the Federal Reserve Bank, but rather a fixed 6% of whatever it is that the bank put up in the first place in order to buy the capital stock. And all of this is legislated by Congress. And the fact that Alan Greenspan could do tomorrow whatever he wants is no different from the chairman of the Food and Drug Administration doing tomorrow whatever he wants to do and uh, so forth, and then finding out that he's not going to be reappointed by the president, just as Alan Greenspan might find that he won't be reappointed by the president if he doesn't do what the president wants and he comes up for renewal. Incidentally, the chairman of the, the Federal Reserve System, or the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, who is the most powerful person in the whole Federal Reserve System by a, a long, long shot, is not appointed for 14 years. He's appointed for only four years. Uh, the other members are appointed for 14 years. Another important point about this is that once those fixed dividends have been paid to the banks, all the additional profits that come from the ability to create money out of thin air that the Federal Reserve System has, uh, all of those additional profits go back into the United States Treasury. And other than having to pay income tax, I don't know of any private organization or private business in the country uh, that has to turn its profits over to the federal government, other than, as I say, just simply paying the usual corporate income tax. And those profits that have been turned over to the government are in the trillions and trillions of dollars and uh, far, far exceed by a magnitude of many, many, many times the amount of money that's gone back to the private bankers who have been forced to join the system in order to remain as national banks. So uh, what this story is that is told by people is that the Federal Reserve System is a private organization that masquerades as a government agency, when in fact it is the opposite that's true. It is a government agency that is masquerading as a private organization, and the reason it was set up that way was to circumvent the Constitution, which has no authority whatsoever for there to be a central bank in the United States. John, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say, too, if you look in the Yellow Pages, like in uh, Boston Yellow Pages, where there is a Federal Reserve Bank, mm -hmm. we'll find it under the business section, as opposed to the government section, mm -hmm. the Yellow Pages. Well, <laughs> so be it, but uh, I don't think... Right. Well, I was going to make a comment that, um, that it, it, it's, it's a government agency, but they want to try to hold it as a private agency. Yes, Did you because, want to comment on that? Yes, because the Constitution uh, specifically omitted uh, authorization for a central bank. That was something that Alexander Hamilton wanted, was the ability to run the money system from Washington. And the Jeffersonites and other people like that among the founding fathers uh, specifically opposed that. And so when Article 1, Section 8 was written for the Constitution, which lays out the authority to do this, that, and the other thing for Congress, it specifically admitted the idea that there could be a central bank. And so when 1913 came, they were still paying pretty much attention to the Constitution. They had violated the Constitution in numerous ways, although they all may all seem pretty trivial compared to the way it's violated today. But even though there had been uh, some uh, violations of the Constitution, basically it was necessary to justify any new major program as being within the authority of the Constitution. And there is no authority for a central bank, so they devised this idea of making it look like it was a private agency, that it was made up of private Federal Reserve banks around the country, and that the Board of Governors were just there primarily to regulate those private banks. Well, of course, as you know and I know, the Board of Governors runs the whole show, and the, and the Federal Open Market Committee, which is kind of a subset of the Board of Governors, uh, the Federal Open Market Committee is the group of people who actually decide, are we going to increase the money supply this week, or are we going to hold it steady, or are we going to contract it a bit, or whatever. And all of this stuff is really run from Washington. But it was set up to make it look like, well, this is not a government agency, this is not a central bank, this is what we're doing is just authorizing the creation of a bunch of private banks around the country. So ever since then, there have been some uh, various people who have railed against the whole thing and railed against the idea that it shouldn't be a private agency. And one of the problems with that is that almost all of the people who promote this idea that it is a pri that is really a bunch of private bankers say that Congress should buy back the Federal Reserve System and issue the money directly and issue it uh, non-interest uh, debt, you know, the pay for the federal debt by just issuing a whole bunch of paper money, which, of course, would create a gigantic inflation in the United States. There are people who do not understand money very well. Howie, uh, can, can I just say, uh, if you do, you can uh, just hold on until after the news break, and I'll be glad to hear anything further you have to say. And we're talking with John in Massachusetts about the composition of the Federal Reserve System, whether it's private or public. Public, <laughs> what, a, what a terrible misnomer that is. Private or government. Uh, things that are government are not really public. They are the province of a few people in Washington who are a minority of the population of the public. John, what did you want to say to wrap this up? Well, yeah, I know. I, was, I don't want to tap phone too long. I just want to ask you, I'm on a cell phone. How does that sound? Oh, you're fine. Am I good? I, I hope so. It's a $300 phone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I hope. This is ultimately ultimately deceptive, you know, if what you're saying is true. Either way, being privately owned or what's going on, or the government in control and saying it's privately owned. 
There's the implications of that. Mm-hmm. And I would say, do you, you know, what is the ultimate purpose of that? And also, I would like to ask you, what do you think of the Senate voting to raise the uh, national debt limit to $800 billion? And um, I'll get off the phone. Okay, well, first of all, as far as the uh, deception that it's privately owned, that's of no importance anymore. It was very important back in 1913 when they wanted to pass this. But today, I mean, nobody thinks that there is any limit whatsoever on government. Government can do anything it wants. And if this were to come up today to set up a central bank, no one would say, hey, there's nothing in the Constitution that authorizes the central bank, any more than anyone would say there's nothing in the Constitution that authorizes the federal government to regulate business or securities or anything else. And so uh, it's no longer a matter uh, of any importance as to whether it's private or publicly owned. Uh, everybody's quite willing to accept that it is a government-owned uh, institution. With regard to the national debt, uh, that's another kind of deception to make people think that there's some kind of limit on the national debt because as soon as the debt approaches the debt limit, they just simply pass a new debt limit. I, I guess it's just a mere formality is the only way to put it. The fact is that they will never say, hey, it's pushed out against the debt limit, so now we're going to have to reduce spending. We have no choice. Either we have to reduce spending or increase taxes because we can't go over that debt limit and we don't want to increase taxes, so we're going to reduce spending. No, that's just simply not going to happen. So they just go ahead and, and pass the an increase in the debt limit. And if anybody says, well, I'm opposed to the increase in the debt limit, are you crazy? If we can't borrow this money, the credit of the United States won't be any good anymore because we will have to renege on bills that we have incurred and so forth and so on, and we can't possibly do that. And so, so of course, the increase in the debt limit uh, passes by an overwhelming majority just with a few diehards voting against it. Thanks so much for your call, John. And let's talk now with Steve in Oregon. Good evening, Steve. Hi, Harry. Earlier in the program when you were first discussing the Federal Reserve System, you were bringing out many instances of how it had been a total failure. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a failure as far as the stated purpose of it goes, but I think as far as its real purpose goes, it's been an overwhelming success. And I think its real purpose, probably more than these two, one is control and the other is a surreptitious form of taxation. Yes, certainly it is a way of drawing resources out of the economy without committing itself to over-taxation. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no question about that. There are three ways that the federal government can get uh, resources. Number one is by taxing them away from the people. Number two, by borrowing them. And number three, by just simply printing the money to go out and buy them. Mm-hmm. And although the Federal Reserve doesn't do anything so clumsy as to just order up a whole bunch of uh, new dollar bills to be printed and hand them to the federal government and say, go out and buy whatever you want, uh, or hand it a credit card or anything of the sort, uh, it, it amounts to that in the final analysis. What they do is to uh, much more involved and complicated and sophisticated, but it all comes down to the same thing, that it's, it's just like any petty dictator just calling up the... Uh, Bureau of the Mint saying, print me up a whole bunch of new bills because I want to buy some for my wife this week. Yes, it's, 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 more, it's more surreptitious. It's more akin to something a magician would do, a lot of uh, smoke and mirrors and distractions in order not to see what's really going on. Mm-hmm. And I, I was, I've was i been dumbfounded for the last 20-some-odd years that it's continued to work with the massive levels of debt that they've been putting out there. I, I thought the dam would burst long ago, but I've been wrong. Well, that's a very important point, and I'm glad you brought it up because you hear Somebody say, this can't go on any longer, and look at, look at these figures, and they will dazzle you with uh, trillions of dollars that uh, the debt has amounted to and the enormous uh, deficit that's going to be incurred this year, and the trade deficit is just out of sight and, and all of these other things, and uh, this can't go on any longer. How could it possibly go on any longer? And it's hard to realize, if you just walked in the door, that these same things were said in the last decade and in the decade before that, and the decade before that. Mm -hmm. And it isn't that the laws of economics have been suspended, and it isn't that these things don't have their price, but it is that we can't predict the timing of these things. And it's possible for what's happening right now to go on for another five years, or another ten years, or another twenty years, or it may the dam may break tomorrow morning, or next month, or next year. There is no way to know. And it's also important to realize that just because the dam hasn't broken, in other words, there hasn't been a massive breakdown of the economy or society or anything as a result of it. It doesn't mean that it hasn't had its cost, because every dollar the government spends takes a dollar's worth of resources out of the hands of the private sector and deprives us of something that we could have had otherwise. So we are paying the cost all along, but even though there hasn't been a, a massive catastrophe. But I know a lot of people who are very bright who have been predicting these things for uh, really as long as 30 years and in many cases 20 years. And uh, there just is no way to predict it. There, it doesn't matter what the figures show. It doesn't matter what the indicators are. There is no way to know when there's going to be any kind of a breakdown and uh, what form the breakdown will take. Uh, these things are just out of the hands of human beings to predict. And it's a mistake to think that just because we know that, for example, uh, printing more money means that inflation would be greater than it would be otherwise, that somehow we can translate that into saying how bad inflation is going to be or when it is going to develop or anything of that sort. The laws of economics are very real, but they are limited in their capacity to predict the future or tell you in what form the future is going to come. 
No, I, I think everything you said is is right on the money. You were you were very accurate on the gold market back in the seventies. Yes, and there was a very important reason for that. Okay, I was lucky. <laughs> I'm glad you admit to that because I know uh, with many of the investors and many of the advice givers that they they will be like gamblers. They'll have runs of luck. Sure, absolutely. And, and that would say that it's something that's based on probability more than any actual thing. Oh yeah, if you if you bet enough times, you're bound to be right a few times, and you can dine out on that for the rest of your life. <laughs> okay, Steve. Well, thanks so much for your call. I appreciate it. And let's talk now with Michael in Kentucky. Good evening, Michael. Uh, good evening to you. Uh, I'm glad you called. What's up? Well, um, I think there's a few factors missing from people's conjecture here. And uh, I, I've heard for years, you know, that the Fed was controlled by foreign bankers, you know, and that they own most of the shares or whatever. It's a Rothschild plot or Rockefeller <laughs> plot. I mean, I've heard all this stuff. I don't and know now it's got to be an Al-Qaeda plot. Well, now, the, um, there is something to, I think, the uh, quotes from, I think it was Mayor Bayer Amschel, which is uh, the guy who was the founders of the House of Rothschild Brothers, it was their dad, I guess, uh, and um, he said uh, he cared not, this is a rough paraphrase, I think he said he cared not who ruled the country as long as he could control the currency, something to that effect. Uh-huh. Um, and of course, it's you know, full fuel for a lot of people um, to look in that direction, foreign control of our banking system, but if uh, if that's the case, you know, we why would they allow, you know, 97% of the profits of the Federal Reserve System to go back into the Treasury of the United States? Sure. And um, that, you know, has been going on for decades, 40-some 40 40 some years, I think, which, oddly enough, uh, works out, I think, to be the same about the same time that they introduced the Comprehensive Annual Financial Reports, which are, uh, in effect, a second set of books for all the different levels of government under, quote, accepted accounting procedures. And, uh, you know, uh, are you familiar with, for instance, what is the largest uh shareholder represented on the board of directors of Motorola or IBM or probably most of the big banks to begin with, institutional funds. And those institutional funds are represented by a member uh, on those board of directors of those corporations, which basically, you know, represents the government's interests of all different levels of investors in those corporations. Why do you say it represents the government's interest if it's institutional funds like uh, large mutual funds or banks or whatever? Well, those are, um, those are um, state entities. You know, we're talking about uh, pension funds uh, and um, bond um on uh, issue, you know, uh, backing. I can't remember the, all the names for it. I'm not an economist. Well, I'll pretend to be one. But, wait but a second. when you say state, en- I'm sorry, did I misunderstand you? Did you say state entities? Well, yeah, you're talking about uh, you know thousands of corporations which are chartered by all different levels of corpora- of uh, government, and uh, they uh, invest their surpluses into. Uh, well, for instance, a few years ago, uh, say a big car dealer wants to come into a state. Well, they'll make a deal with basically with the state government where they don't pay any property taxes, and the state gets to get all the payroll taxes from the people that they employ. And uh, and part of that deal also might include that the state itself, uh, for instance, the state of Kentucky or the state of New York or whoever, will get a block of shares in that company. And where do those shares get listed at? They don't get listed as an asset in the state budget. Where do those uh, profits for those dividends from those shares go? They don't go into the budget. Where do they com- go? Comprehensive annual financial report. That's where those uh, assets. Well, what's are the comprehensive financial report? I mean, who who that's gets this? Who gets the money? No matter how the books are kept, who is it that gets the money that's profiting? The government. The government gets that. And so what can, you're saying is, can, so can, you're saying the government has more money than we know about. Then the government has more money than virtually anybody, or more assets than virtually any other entity there is. Well, we know that, but 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 that's are you saying the that budget? the government has money that we don't know about? Most people don't know about it. I would say the vast majority of people don't know about it because all they ever, all well, they ever well, hear about is the budget. Yeah, but where where is this money? If they're getting money from dividends, what happens to that money? They can turn around and reinvest it in other stuff and keep it off the budget, too, keep it in the comprehensive annual financial report. But for what purpose? If all, all they're doing is taking this money and rolling it over into more investments and so on, mm, and not using like it for a government uh, market, project. Market stabilization funds, I don't know, things to uh, to manipulate the stock market for national security reasons that could keep, you know, they can have uh, strategic investment funds and things well, like that. Well, they have been doing a very good job of manipulating the no, stock market, have they? I don't know that they, I don't know that we know exactly what they've been doing because if, if they essentially own controlling shares in, in the vast majority of the largest index of stock companies and they, they get all the profits from the Federal Reserve, in effect, 97%, yeah, but those go into the federal budget that we know about. Mm, I'm not sure that they do. They oh, yeah, they do. They show up in the federal budget as, as part of the revenue of the federal government. So how, how in effect, is the Federal Reserve controlled by foreigners? And why? And see, that's in well, who said that it was controlled by foreigners? A I lot of people say it is. Yeah, I know, but a lot of people say things they don't know anything about. And uh, But therein, therein is the, what I'm, the point I'm trying to get at is the government is interested in the profits of the Federal Reserve going up through debt, you know, through more and more debt. More debt, the Federal Reserve is... Uh, servicing and collecting interest on, the more profit they make. So the government, in effect, has a motivation there 
for increasing debt because if, if the debt increases, the profit of the Federal Reserve increases more money comes back to the government through the Federal Reserve. So yeah, it's and, the more basis. Money, and more money is spent on interest every year, too. Well, and the, it is the basis of the banking system. The national debt exists because of the banking system. And so, therefore, if we have this banking system, we're never going to get rid of the national debt. Well, so, no, wait a minute. The national debt exists because the federal government spends more money than it takes in. And that's only on the budget. just pure and simple economics. Only on the budgetary side of things, and they keep it that way. They do not, anything that can, can make a profit, any asset that is giving us a return or giving the government a return, is not kept in the budgetary part of the books. That's what the comprehensive Have budget. you ever looked at the federal budget? I've looked at the uh, comprehensive annual financial reports. They're, they're hard as heck to weed through. Have you looked at the... the um, um, analysis of uh, a couple of guys uh, on the internet, uh, one called Gerald R. Klatt, who's a former uh, Air Force accountant, uh, and another guy by the name of Walter Burian, who is a, uh, a former commodities broker, and uh, both of them basically agree on, on uh, their numbers and their analysis of the assets that our various levels of government have, in the, you know, to the tune of 30 some trillion dollars uh, on the federal government side, which is double what. You know, some people say our national debt, in effect, is seven seventeen trillion dollars, as opposed to whatever they say it is now. Seven trillion. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I really think that this is much ado about nothing. And well, they have more assets; they could pay off the national debt if they wanted to. I don't believe that. I think the state of California. I think, could. That, I think that two guys who have, have read something and misinterpreted and have made a big thing out of it, just like some people misread uh, the Internal Revenue Code and suddenly think we don't have to pay income tax. Uh, if, welcome back, Harry Brown here, and we're talking with Michael in Kentucky. Uh, Michael, do you want to say something further? Well, uh, I appreciate the libertarian point of view, and I appreciate you know what your uh, show, of course, you you, you uh, allow people to uh, bring up topics that you're just not going to hear about much in uh, most uh, media outlets. I think, especially you know what's called mainstream or major media, but and uh, that's one of the that's one of the big problems with this whole uh, budgetary process and the comprehensive annual financial reports. But um, uh, as an example that I read about myself in the major media, and I did not get the whole story from the Los Angeles Times or whatever. It's hard to people to, uh, for people to fathom that just the city of Los Angeles and uh, the government in general is the biggest player in the derivatives market, which is such you know a complicated. Who told you that? Huh? Who told you that? Um, well, the city of Los Angeles lost a billion dollars, and this was admitted to in the major media. A billion dollars playing derivatives, and uh, they started crying that they were going to have to shut down everything. Like, you know, we're going to have to you know shut down the pools and. Uh-huh. The, and this was in like the Los Angeles Times. You can find the well, archive. Well, various municipal governments invest in various securities, and sometimes they do a horrendous job. About 20 years ago, the chief financial officer in the city of San Jose received an award as being the city treasurer of the year in California for his brilliance. And the next year, the city of San Jose threatened bankruptcy. And this does happen. But when has the government ever been convicted of insider trading? Yeah, they, they do put options as well, which is the same sort of thing we saw in 9/11, where somebody bet that the airline stock was going to fall, and it did. Yeah, well, we well Michael, what, we, we all of this that you're bringing up is right along with what I was saying at the beginning of the broadcast, uh-huh. is, and that is that we get our attention diverted to all of these secrets that are supposedly going on that can't be proven and can't uh-huh. offhand be disproven, and we get all involved in all of this when the real point of the whole thing that we should be worried about is that government is forced, and that force is hurting people, and the blessings of liberty are being lost because government is way too big, government is way too expensive, government is way too intrusive, and it doesn't matter how they keep their books, and it doesn't matter what some people are doing behind closed doors in secret. What matters is that we have to explain to the American people the blessings of liberty so that they will reduce government, and then all of these so-called supposed secret things that are going behind closed doors will be swept out in the course of it if they even exist. Well, they, they have virtually um, un, uh, unlimited resources, I'm sure you've heard. That, uh, based on the accounting practices at the Pentagon for years, they issued uh, a report that said they still couldn't account for $1.1 trillion just at the Pentagon. Because there is so much waste and because there is so much sloppiness and because nobody is ever held accountable in government, nobody ever suffers the same fate that somebody in the private sector does uh, mm-hmm. when he does the same thing. But sure. that's, that's perfectly understandable. That's the nature of government, and that's why government has to be reduced. Well, the way the story went in Los Angeles was after people started trying to expose, like you're talking about, expose so that the public will know that you know, when they were crying that they wanted to shut down fire stations and cut back on police overtime and all this stuff, it came out that all these other investments that they have totaled $16 trillion. And so uh, losing yeah, a trillion... Los, no, no, no. I'm sorry, Michael. The city of Los Angeles doesn't have I'm $16 sorry, trillion. $16 billion, excuse me. Yeah. Billion, billion, not trillion. But they lost a trillion on derivatives. They still had 16 uh, I mean billion. Lots of billion on derivatives. They still had sixteen billion out right. there playing but, around. But, but there's nothing unusual about that, and there's nothing sinister about it. It's just the nature of government well, to, they, to waste money and to, to use money unproductively and to never produce the results that it's uh, supposed to produce. Well, I think they do 
they do produce some results because they are building assets. They're not losing. Uh, they're not losing money. Uh, according to the secret study that you read about about the comprehensive financial report, well, it's not uh, which makes about as much sense as saying that there's no law that uh, anybody has to pay income tax. It's no. unimportant. What's important is what government is and what we must do to reduce government to the absolute minimum possible. And is, and whenever we take our eyes off of that, then we are simply wasting time. If what we really want is to bring the blessings of liberty back to the United States of America. Michael, thanks so much okay. for your call. We got to move on. We got other people waiting in line, uh, but I appreciate your call and call anytime. Now let's talk to Jonathan in uh, Washington, D.C. Good evening, Jonathan. HB, uh, good show as usual. Um, I wasn't going to call in tonight because I, I don't like to take up too much of your airtime, but uh, after I heard what you were saying about conspiracy theories at the beginning of the show, I had to call in and say amen to that, and that last call was just a great example of it. And uh, there are just so many people who they sound really reasonable, but they just can't get off of these conspiracy theories. And no matter what you say, it just keeps coming back to them. And uh, I, I really think that this is a bad thing for libertarians to be focusing on, in general, on libertarian candidates in particular. Oh, you yeah. should never, ever be getting into the origins of the Federal Reserve or, or the ratification of the income tax or whether uh, George Bush flew a plane into 9-11 or hired someone <laughs> to do it or whatever the, some he, people think. He used his remote control. To... Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. But these, it reminds me of when I used, to, I used to work for the party and occasionally – I have somebody ask me uh, what I did, and I tell them, and they say something like, "Oh, is uh, is Lyndon Larouche still your your guy?" Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I I always say, "No, Lyndon Larouche has never been associated with the Libertarian Party or the Libertarian movement in any way." And I couldn't understand why they they would even think that. Why? And it, this happened on more than one occasion. And uh, well, why did you uh, kick Lyndon Larouche out of the party? <laughs> yeah, something, something like that, uh, uh, or we did kick him out, or something. And uh, I I could, couldn't figure it out. I thought maybe. It, the best to come up with was because Libertarian and Lyndon LaRouche sounded kind of yeah, sure. similar, which is not a good explanation. So, but so what you're saying is too many people are giving the impression we're in the same camp by... Yeah, because Lyndon, Lyndon LaRouche has been a... He's basically a conspiracy theorist. Sure. And that is... It recently occurred to me that that might be why they somehow associate him with us, and we have got to get off of this. So amen to that, and uh, uh, good show. Okay, thanks so much for uh, seconding my point. I appreciate it. All right, uh, we are now going to go to Virginia and talk with Mark. Good evening, Mark. Good evening. What's on your mind tonight? Hi. Many of your uh, listeners have probably heard of Ayn Rand, the mm -hmm. uh, novelist and philosopher. And uh, after she died, her uh, heir set up what's called the Ayn Rand Institute. I would say the so-called Ayn Rand Institute, because these days they, they've violated every principle of her philosophy. And I thought I'd read just one example, just a couple of sentences, uh, that illustrates that. Uh, it's, this is in regard to the war. The title of the article is War Powers Without War by Robert Trzinski. Robert Trzinski is on the staff of the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, it was it's dated December 3, 2001, and it contains a weasel word. A, a weasel word is a word that is deliberately misleading or ambiguous. Mm -hmm. and here it goes. Wartime expansion of government is always mitigated. Oh, by the way, mitigated means to become mild, milder or less severe, and what makes it a weasel word is that it doesn't say how much milder or how much less severe. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't mean anything. Wartime expansion of government is always mitigated by the fact that it is explicitly temporary. It's justified only by the duration. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, when the war is over, the president's extraordinary powers are revoked. Oh. And the people can then demand that the government be limited once again to its ordinary powers. Close quote. Okay, and, and then so uh, the Ayn Rand Institute is going to leave the demand, I take it, if, I, if the war ever ends. Yes. Uh, it's extraordinary that an intelligence person would say such a thing. Uh, uh, then it goes on. He concludes the essay at the very end. A declaration of war is our best guarantee. He's running a, the point of this essay is to, he wants us to declare war against Iraq. They explicitly lobbied for war against Iraq. Oh, yeah. Uh, let me start over again. A declaration of war is our best guarantee that we will be able to restrain government and reclaim our full legal right when the war is over. Isn't that just perverse? Yeah, and unfortunately they didn't get the declaration of war, but they still supported the war. And an interesting book is called Crisis and Leviathan. It was written by Robert Higgs, who is now a fellow at the Independent Institute in Oakland, California. And I really do recommend the book to anyone who's interested in the subject of wars and governments and governmental power and anything uh, in remotely related to that, because uh, Higgs' uh, thesis, which he backs up with example after example after example, is that war is the greatest factor in ratcheting up the size of government. That whenever you have a, in fact, any kind of crisis, but war, of course, is the number one type of crisis, but also a financial crisis like the Great Depression or anything of the sort will ratchet government up, but it never comes back to where it was before the crisis, and which is directly contrary to what uh, the contention was of the man from the Ayn Rand Institute, that it doesn't go back to the way it was before. 
And uh, the book is really extraordinarily good. It gives many, many examples of how government doesn't deliver on its promises. And Hicks is a very, very rigorous historian, and he's also a very readable writer. The title is Crisis and Leviathan. Crisis and Leviathan, and uh, it's... Uh, of course, available on Amazon. If you just do a search at Amazon for Crisis and Leviathan by Higgs, uh, you'll find it. I have no idea how much it costs, but it's well worth the reading. And it, as I said, directly contradicts what they said, that uh, once the war's over, we go back to peacetime. We didn't go back in 1945 to the way things were in 1941, I can assure you. Or 1918, that's uh, the World War One, or uh, 1860. Right, right. The uh, Civil War. Right. Uh, every time the government acquires new powers that it doesn't get rid of. And one of the, the best and quickest examples is that during the Second World War, the government decided to institute withholding of income tax. Uh, before then, everybody just filled out his form on April, uh, uh, not April, but at that time it was March 15th, and got it in by March 15th. And if he owed uh, $2,000 worth of income tax for the year, then he wrote a check for $2,000 and sent it in. And so it was very visible to each individual how much he was paying in income tax. But during the war, they instituted withholding, whereby employers were forced to withhold so much a week or so much a month from an employee's uh, income in the form of taxes and forwarded to the government and so on. And it was as a temporary measure to help fight the war. But when the war ended, it didn't disappear, and it is still with us today, uh, almost 50 years, actually almost 60 years after the end of the war. And uh, it is just one example of the way that these things that come about during government, during wars and other crises do not leave when the crisis ends. So there. All right. I agree. Good. Uh, thanks so much for the example, Mark. I really appreciate it. And I do also want to remind you that, as I've said so often, that you were not put on this earth to save the world, and you certainly weren't put on this earth to investigate every conspiracy known to man. And, you know, one of the interesting things about the conspiracies is that they are presented with such force and such fervor, and you are treated like an idiot or an apathetic fool if you won't run out and investigate this, uh, if you won't look into this terrible thing that's going on. And I hope that when you are prodded by people to do this, that you will stop and think and ask yourself, how does what I say appear to people when I'm trying to convince somebody of something? Am I talking in a way that makes them just want to run away and hide or am I appealing to them in a way that they might have a reason to pay attention? And the only thing that I can think of as a basis for making them want to pay attention is because you're talking about some way that their life could be so much better than it is now. I hate to hear self-improvement ads that say, in effect, your life is a disaster. Uh, uh, let me change your life completely. Let me turn it upside down for you. Uh, because nobody wants to look at things that way. But people do want to know how they could have thousands of dollars more to spend, how they could make more decisions uh, over their own life, how they wouldn't have to worry so much about what their children are learning in schools and things of this sort. And anything that you can present to show that it could be much better than it is now is going to be taken and looked into to a certain extent. So always talk to people about how much better our lives could be, not how much worse they'll be once they realize what terrible things are going on in the world. This is Harry Brown. Thank you so much for uh, paying attention tonight. Uh, and thanks to Scott Hartman for taking care of everything in Minnesota. And please, please do come back next week. Good night.